Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Vanessa, your host for this evening. I am the Publicity Officer for IUTM Professionals Coventry in Warwickshire and I'm also on the Robot Day Committee. I'd like to say a massive thank you for taking the time to join us this evening for the webinar on soft material robots as part of the Robot Day 2022 virtual series. And this particular lecture is in collaboration with IUTM Professionals Coventry and Warwickshire. I'd just like to give out some notices before we get started. This event is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube, so please do stay tuned to find out where you can view that at a later point. Um, there will also be a short Q&A session at the end of the talk, so please do feel free to submit any questions you have for our speaker tonight using the chat box feature. I'll be monitoring and reading them out at the end for you. And there will also be some contact details provided at the end. So if your question isn't answered, please don't worry. Um, hopefully we'll get that sorted for you at the end. Um, and just before we get started as well, I would just like to uh, come on and promote a couple of events that we also have coming up for Robot Day. So some upcoming events, uh, just to make you aware, uh, we have some virtual reality workshops coming up um, in October at the Derby Quad. Um, Robotic Explorers in Space, which is another webinar um, as part of the series um, in later October. Um, automotive design and overview and looking forward to the future, which is a hybrid event hosted by Derby Quad and it's also online as well if you wanted to join there. And we also have mathematics in the control of robots, which promises to be another wonderful lecture happening in November. And we would also like to announce um, one of our upcoming events for IUT Young Professionals Commentary in Warwickshire. And I'd like to introduce our chair um, to just introduce that um, particular event for you. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, hi, my name is Calvin. I'm the chairperson for, this is a mouthful, so bear with me, the IUT Coventry and Warwickshire Young Professionals Committee. And uh, the event, as you can see on the screen, is our annual welcome event. So if you are based around Coventry or Warwickshire, or even slightly further away, and you'd like to attend an evening of just fun games and networking, you're more than welcome to attend at Coventry University. The event is free to attend, and there will be some refreshments. So if that interests you and you're in the region to attend, please, by all means, all is welcome. Thank you so much, Calvin. Um, so if you'd like to stay up to date with any of our activities um, on social media for Robot Day, we do have an official website. Um, we are also on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. So if you want to get in touch or just see what we're up to, please feel free to give us a follow. And as I said earlier, this webinar will be uploaded to the IUTM Professionals Coventry and Warwickshire YouTube channel. So if you just search for our name in YouTube, it should come up for you. And without further ado, um, I would like to pass the floor over to our wonderful speaker for tonight, Professor Helga Wunderman from UCL Engineering. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And um, I can say I'm following you already on Twitter. So I hope everyone in the in the meeting today will also do that if they have a Twitter channel or Instagram channel. Um, I can only recommend that channel and also fantastic events that you guys are organizing. And many thanks to everyone involved in this um, webinar and um, inviting me actually from London to talk to you. And I'm very happy to um, say that if we even reach tonight um, colleagues and friends from Bahrain. So it's not only um, visitors and the audience um, attendees from Coventry and Warwickshire, but also from other parts of the world, which is of course fantastic. So thanks very much, Vanessa, for introducing me. I am a roboticist from University College in London, not very far. Um, uh, from where you are probably tonight. And today, I want to talk to you about the research that I'm doing in my lab with my team on soft material robots. And 
Um, maybe that is a field that interest is of interest to you. Maybe that is a field that can inspire you in um, your career path um, that you will um, go along. So I am running a team at UCL that looks into different type of materials and tries to understand how we can create robotic and haptic interfaces using different type of materials. And we very much focus on soft materials. And these soft materials can be either silicon or rubber-like materials or fabric materials. So you can actually suture your robot. And most of the times we use um, quite different actuations. So whereas traditional robots are made out of rigid components like electromagnetic electric motors um, that have a coil inside, they are made out of metal pieces. We are actuating our robots using pneumatic air pressurization or hydraulic actuation. And there we focus on three different um, three different technologies and components. So on the one side, we look into haptic devices. So you might know haptic devices from your telephone that gives you messages using vibration. So there are vibro-tactile actuators inside your phone, and they can convey messages without um, any audio feedback. So by, for example, a very short vibro-tactile um, actuation, you understand that there is an email coming. When there is a sequential vibrotactile feedback coming, you might understand that this is a call. So we are looking into different type of haptic feedback, is, uh, feedback systems that can give you or the human um, information. And I will talk about this um, in the talk day later on. Then in some cases, um, we would need to first understand what we need to feedback uh, with our haptic feedback um, devices. So we need to sense. So we need to sense, for example, in healthcare, soft tissue stiffness. Uh, we need to sense the interaction forces that a human has with, um, or a robot has with the environment, with objects. And we want to feed these forces back to a user who teleoperates these um, uh, robots. And then my lab also looks into soft robotic manipulators. And these are specifically interesting for us because they are flexible, they're soft, but our robots are also able to change their stiffness. So they go from soft into a stiffer configuration. And our lab very much focuses on three different types of applications. So on one side, on the left, you see healthcare engineering. And there we look very much into robotic assisted, minimally invasive surgery and interventions, but also into phantom development and haptic, haptics for upper limb prostheses. And today I want to give you an example what we do in terms of development of soft manipulators for minimally invasive surgery. And then I will also give you an example about the work that we do in collaborative robots and for haptic um, driving seats in highly automated or automated vehicles. So let's start in, in the domain of healthcare engineering. And I mentioned there already that I very much concentrate on minimally invasive surgery. So what is minimally invasive surgery? Let's start with this figure here on the left-hand side that illustrates a case where clinicians perform open surgery. In general, you can see here a reasonably large, and I try to put my pointer on in a second. So here you can see a quite large incision that is made. The patient is opened and essentially the clinician is going with the hands into the uh, patient and can feel the tissue, can distinguish between healthy and unhealthy, healthy and cancerous tissue, and then manipulates this with all the five fingers and 10 fingers, if you count both of the hands, and during the operation. You can imagine that there are some disadvantages. Of course, you have a very large incision, so. Um, it needs 
quite a long time to recover from a, a surgery like this. And there might be blood loss and this has to be rebuilt, but also the patient um, remain or there is a scar remaining, which is as long as the incision. So this over the years has moved to minimally invasive surgery or also called laparoscopic surgery. So instead of making a large incision, what the surgeon is doing is a number of smaller incisions, and these are up to 15 millimeter in length. And they are distributed in this case around the abdominal area, for, for example, to carry out an appendix removal. And you can straight away see, of course, that there are smaller incisions. So these will heal much quicker. There might be less blood loss. Uh, during an operation like this. But of course, what you see here also is that the clinician doesn't have access with the hands and with the fingertips. So there is the sensation that the surgeon would have in an open surgery on the left hand side is lost. And in this case, we develop um, haptic interfaces that can sense the interaction during an operation like this and then feed it back to a clinician. But carrying on with this um, laparoscopic surgery on the right-hand side, I would like to demonstrate to you in a video what it means to operate with laparoscopic tools that are then inserted into these so-called trocar ports that you can see here, four of them. So here you can see in the first part of the video, a long tube, and there's a camera embedded at the tip through which the um, surgeon can, can view the internal, um, the internal uh, matter of the uh, patient through on, on, on the screen. So in this case, the surgeon can also use a number of laparoscopic tools. And you can see this here nicely in the video. They are slim, long, rigid, um, instruments that have, for example, a grasper at the tip, as you can see here, but others have also a knife. So the surgeon in a in laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgeon was used one camera that goes into the center to give a view inside the human body, and then at least two of these tools in an operation. So that the triangulation that we all humans have when we manipulate objects, as you can see now in my, with my hands. So you have an object that you manipulate, for example, the stone, and then you have the vision in the center, and then two arms that manipulate the phone, that you reproduce this inside the human. So you have in the center, the camera, and then you use two of the tools, as you can see here, that are introduced into the human, of course, that's a phantom, to then carry out an operation. And these trocar ports are then used to feed not only the, um, the camera in this case or the tools inside, but also inflate the abdominal area of the patient to generate this additional space that is required to carry out an operation. So now what has this to do with robotics? There have been some um, companies who taken, have taken this approach forward and they have mounted actually these laparoscopic tools to a robotic arm. And one of the dominant and gold standards in robotic surgery is intuitive surgical. And they have released many years ago their system called the Da Vinci surgical system that you can see here. So the, you can see in this video here, a robotic, a main robotic trunk, as I would call it, with up to four arms. So they are numbered here, one, two, three, four. And each of them is carrying a laparoscopic tool or a laparoscopic camera. So one of them has a laparoscopic cam camera to which the surgeon can view the inside of the patient. And then there are three arms that either carry a grasper or a gripper or a knife. So all of these arms can then be inserted into the patient and the surgeon can steer and navigate each of these arms independently through 
a console. And the console that you can see here provides the surgeon on the one side with 3D vision. So here you can see the interface to which the surgeon can have 3D vision available, but also allows the clinician to use the two um, consoles that you can see here to nicely navigate each of these instruments inside the human body. And so you can see it's a very nicely designed engineering um, uh, technology that is very intuitive. And you can see how intuitively the surgeon can actually move the risk and the movement of the risk is then replicated. I'm sorry, about well, this is then nicely moved and nicely replicated to the laparoscopic um, tools, as you can see in a second here. So, um, sorry, I just jumped the video. So here you can see how the wrist movements are so nicely reproduced in the lap laparoscopic um, tool, as you can see here. So this has been very much a step input in the way that um, surgeons have been carried out laparoscopic surgery for many years. Now, if you look at the landscape of robotic surgery over the last few years, Intuitive is, has not been the only company who have proposed a surgical system. So you can see many other companies who have emerged on the market and some of them have actually released a surgical robot um, to be used in clinical settings. And so you can see here single port instruments or surgical robots for single port or multi port surgery. So there we call each of these incisions a port. So they are either used for only having one port to the human or multiple ports. But there are also vascular or neurosurgical platforms emerging. And they are mainly concerned at the moment about steering a catheter to the point of interest or fusing different sensing data that are available through, for example, MRI scans or CT scans. But let's have a look at another surgical system, and that's actually coming from CMR Surgical. That is in a way in a way very similar to the one that I showed you earlier on. However, there are quite significant differences in the way the whole system is set up. And here you can see that instead of having one major trunk that has four arms mounted um, on top of the trunk, this system has individual robots that can be placed around the um, operating um, in the operating theater and each of these um, robots are carried in then one laparoscopic tool as you can see so this is very suitable for operating theaters for instance and here you can see a full system so each of these robots that are carrying one laparoscopic tool are mounted on one platform and all together they can then carry out uh, a surgery. And this is very suitable for operating theaters that are in general not very big because you can actually make a choice as the surgeon how many of these arms would be required for what type of surgery. So you would not always have a massive system inside the operating theater, but you can have a more adaptable approach. On the left hand side, you see also that there's an upright position of the surgeon with 3D glasses. So 3D vision is also available in this system, but the person doesn't look through goggles, but instead has an upright position and watches the screen continuously. And there are also differences in the way that the console is designed. So you can see there are similarities, there are differences in the way that different companies approach these systems. However, when you look at the way that these laparoscopic tools are configured over the abdominal area, as you can see here, is that all of these instruments are straight instruments that go through a troca port. And then 
it is very challenging for the surgeon to maneuver these straight instruments around organs that you need to overcome in order to target the um, area of interest. So in some cases, in fact, we have observed that the entire robot has to be repositioned because the workspace is limited. So what we have done is in our lab, and that was as part of a huge EU project, um, was to look into inspiration from the from nature and in particular from the octopus because the octopus as you can see here has arms that don't have any backbones that are flexible that they can be navigated by the octopus it can be actually squeezed through narrow openings as you can see here it can be stiffened so there are muscle groups inside each of these arms and when they are actuated by the octopus they can actually stiffen to then manipulate um, crab for instance or obstacles so we have taken inspiration from the animals and we have looked into surgical um, uh, surgical challenges for example that appear in total mesorectal excision or um, or colorectal surgery. So in this case, you can see here, this part of the colon contains cancerous tissue and should be removed. And during the surgery, the surgeon is actually starting here in the colon area to separate all the surrounding tissue from the colon, and then works the way down here, the, the, the descending colon, and removes this part of the colon before suturing the healthy parts back together. So you can see why the uh, tissue around the colon needs to be separated because of course here there's some length missing that needs to be pulled downwards. Now I will show you um, a few uh, patients uh, pictures. So if you cannot see any blood, please uh, bear with me for two minutes um, and I will tell you when these are over. And I will just show now a picture of the location of these stroker ports in a real setting, which you can see on the right hand side. So you can see the camera is positioned here at point A, through which the surgeon will then have a, a view of the inside of the patient. And then there are two stroker ports, which will be connected to a grass bar and a cutting machine. And then there is a laparoscopic assistant here who also has a choker port on the bottom left. And you can see from this picture that these access points are fairly widespread across the abdominal area of the patient. And the workspace that needs to be covered is reasonably big. I show you in a picture or in a video here on the top right what the challenges are. Here you can see the internal view of the surgeon and these two laparoscopic tools are inserted to further make you the way towards the cancerous tissue and you can see that most of the times these laparoscopic tools are working crossover and that will be very challenging because your right hand side needs to understand that you're doing a task on the left hand side in the image and your left hand is doing some tasks on the right hand side of the image. So it's very challenging. It's more like typing crossover on your keyboard of the computer, which I believe that you find very challenging. So what we have been looking into is, and now I do not show any clinical uh, videos anymore. So you can look back if you like. So what we have come up with is not only a flexible device, but a soft stiffness controllable and manipulator that you can see here on the left hand side. This manipulator on the left hand side has three modules, so one, two, three, and each of the um, modules are cylindrical um, silicon based um, bodies that contain at least three empty chambers. And now we can actuate these three inner chambers and when you actuate them you can see it in this image here and also in the video at the bottom that the membrane inflates so you create a ballooning effect 
But more importantly, what you create is here a bending behavior. So by actuating one or two of these chambers, you can either move the robot in one direction or another, or if you even actuate three of these chambers simultaneously, you can create elongation. And in order to prevent this ballooning effect, we put a braided sheath around the cylindrical shape of the um, manipulator in order to prevent some of the ballooning. So now you can put multiple of these segments together. So on the right hand side, you can see three of these segments um, in series. And then you can actuate each of these segments and navigate them through your environment, for instance. You need to appreciate here that the prototype, the first prototype that we built on the right hand side is actually 25 to 30 millimeter in diameter. So if you remember, a minimally invasive surgery would make up to 50 millimeter in length incision into the abdominal area. So it is two to three times bigger than tools that sh should be used for minimally invasive surgery. So that was a constraint that we very much early in the project faced. But our constraint or our challenge was also this ballooning effect that happened inside the, um, each of these modules. So here you can see how it doesn't only expand outside, but also inside each of these segments, which interferes then, for instance, with sensors that we wanted to integrate. So in order to overcome these challenges, we proposed a second prototype that is miniaturized. And we achieved this miniaturization through a fabric that is helically um, surrounding each of these um, actuation chambers. So you can see six of them here, so three pairs. Two of those actuation, pair, uh, actuation chambers are always actuated in, uh, simultaneously. So you have again three actuation chamber pairs. And this fiber that is surrounding each of these actuation pairs will in fact prevent any axial expansion and result only in elongation of these chambers. So here you can now see two segments, a two segment prototype that we have developed. You can nicely see the yellow pressure tubes that are feeding air pressure to the tip module. And when you then actuate one or two chamber pairs, you can achieve bending. Or in a second, you will see all three chamber pairs actuated simultaneously. You can then use, you can then elongate this um, module. And this was one of the first prototypes that we have developed on this size. So this is still um, at the upper limit. So 14.5 millimeter in diameter. And significant here is, is a free empty chamber to accommodate, for instance, instruments such as an endoscopic camera. So you can see this prototype has an endoscopic camera embedded and you can see the view um, on the top left hand side. So we took this into phantom environments, as you can see here, but also a further development of this uh, manipulator we took to human cadaver tests at the University of Dundee. But we really wanted to further miniaturize these type of robots. And you have observed most of our chambers, in fact, were circular shaped. So this is work that we have been doing, um, led by GLA Sh uh, in my lab, who investigated different cross-sectional shapes of actuation chambers, as you can see here. They are still 14.5 in diameter, so we didn't change the diameter, but we wanted to investigate what a different cross-sectional shape would have on performance criteria, such as bending behavior or even stiffness of the manipulator. So here you can see both of these type of robots. So the type one robot is the one with circular shaped um, actuation chambers and the type one is with semicircular shaped. And you can see here maybe from the video, but also from the graph that the semicircular shaped actuation chambered 
robot can achieve higher bending angle or the same bending angle at a lower pressure compared to the um, robot that has circular shape robot. Then we also did a test to understand the points that the robot can reach in space. So we understood what is the workspace. So we actuated each of the chambers from 0 to 1.2 bar and then understood what is the um, volume that the robot can reach points in. And you can see that here also the robot that has semicircular shaped actuation chambers is outperforming the one that has circular shaped robot. And then we uh, summarized everything in a table that you can see here. So you can see that the semicircular shaped soft robot has 30% more bending angle. But if you compare the stiffness of the robot, it actually can achieve between let's say 20 and 25% less stiffness. And you can imagine why, because of course, there's less material inside the um, body of the robot overall. So this, this solution with using different cross-sectional shapes of the manipulator actually allows further miniaturization because as you can see here is we can embed it nicely in a flattened way inside the robot. And here we have, I think this one is just below 12 millimeter diameter, but we have been going through uh, manufacturing processes to even go down to eight millimeter in diameter, which is very comparable to standard laparoscopic tools that are used nowadays um, in surgery. So let me now talk a little bit about the work that we do in collaborative robots and how soft robots or even soft stiffness controllable robots can help a new to build a new generation of collaborative robots. You probably have seen many YouTube videos or have been visiting plants yourselves where these type of industrial robots are building or assembling, for example, vehicles. They are pre-programmed. They carry out each task um, very accurately with a high repetition. Um, they are uh, deployed into situations where they actually outperform the human being in terms of their capability to repeat over and over again a process with high accuracy. What you see here on the outside is that all of these robots are caged. So whenever there's a human being entering this workspace of the robot, the entire robotic system will stop because they are not safe to work in close collaboration with humans. They do not have sensors that can sense obstacles inside their workspace environment. So there has been coming a new generation of robots, which are called collaborative robots. And these collaborative robots, they are meant to guarantee safe human robot in human robot interaction. And how they do it is they understand how much force they apply to their environment. And then they use sensors and these sensors can be either on the surface of the robot or integrated into the joints to then understand that there is an interaction with the environment with an obstacle and then they can adjust their compliance or stiffness. There have been a number of different robots, collaborative robots or cobots made for these purposes but you can see that all of them are still based on rigid components. So they have metal links and electromagnetic um, motors in their joints. So when there is a collision with a human, they would be still, they could potentially still harm the human being if there is a, an interaction, physical interaction happening. There are companies also looking now into stiffness controllable joints, as you can see here, that are not made out of electromagnetic um, motors, but they are making use of uh, pneumatic actuation, 
one of the examples you can see in this um, video here. So when you look into the joint here, these joints are made out of a rotational mechanism that has two different chambers. And you can, of course, actuate one of these chambers to change the bending angle, the rotation. But at the same time, it is possible to actuate both of these chambers to increase the stiffness. So this is very much like your arm and your muscles in the arm. You can use one side of the muscles to change the angle of your elbow. And if you use both of the muscles, you will um, achieve a certain level of stiffness. So what we found is that, of course, there are works that are able to achieve the overall compliance adjustment using different variable stiffness joints. But if you want to really change the local stiffness, you really need to do some work on the stiffness or on the links of a rope. So what we have done is we have developed a variable stiffness link. You can see the cross-sectional view of our link. It's essentially a tube. And the shell of the tube is made out of a composite of a fabric material with silicon. So you can, it's very much similar to a car or a bicycle tire that you can pressurize by air. And with increasing pressure inside this variable stiffness link, you can adjust the, um, the stiffness. So we've built our first prototype made out of two of these variable stiffness links, as you can see here. And we used off the shelf servo motors in between. There's a DC motor at the base who carries all the weight. And now in the video, so here are the off the shelf electric motors. And now you can see using a compressor, we can control the air inside these links. And with low air pressure, you achieve a low stiffness. So you can essentially fold the entire robot and increasing it, you can stiffen the links and um, achieve a very high stiffness. So we have built several versions of this. We built links that have, that use this type of technology um, to detect collision. So you can see here how it collides with a finger. And what is happening now is that the pressure inside will increase, will peak. And based on this, you can just um, do a control strategy that if the peak, a peak in pressure is achieved, that the, um, that the link should reduce the pressure inside and become soft. So we have done a modular system that you can see here. So we have used advanced servo motors that also have a sensor inside that can, up, so they can return the amount of bending. And then what we have done is we looked into open loop control in combination with a neural network to compensate for the stiffness loss and when the pressure is low in these uh, bending angles. So you can see, for instance, here, um, there's a trajectory that the robot is um, following. And when the load is increased at the very tip of the manipulator, the overall positioning becomes less accurate. And we have developed a neural network that helps the robot to compensate for this error in position. So now I would take the last few minutes to talk about the work that we are doing in autonomous vehicles. And I can see already a question there that I will um, answer after the talk. Um, I believe that all of you have been familiar with the work that people are doing in order to deliver the first driverless car in the world on the road. And that is also commercially available. So uh, you can see here that the work on automated vehicle actually started more than a hundred years ago with first experiments. And you can see some of the milestones that companies and researchers have, have achieved. In general, there are different levels of autonomy and the SAE, 
divides this into five levels. Level zero, you can see on the left-hand side, is when we humans drive manually, so we need to use our eyes for vision and our hands to steer and navigate the vehicle. And then level five on the other side, where the system is entirely able to navigate by itself. There's no human anymore needed and we can enjoy our ride. And there is a transition between them. Different levels have different type of technology available. For example, adaptive cruise control or lane keeping, lane changing, for instance, that allow the driver to partially drive um, autonomously. The real difference is between level two and level three. So any technology below level two, if or if anything happens in vehicles um, with level two or below autonomy, the car, the driver of the car will be liable for anything that will happen. For level three upwards, the liability of any incident that will happen potentially lies with the technology and the vehicle. So we have been looking into some statistics and some accidents that happened involving these automated vehicles in different levels of autonomy. And one of them you can see here. So this was very fatal. You can see here the Tesla in white following another vehicle with adaptive cruise control. And one of the, fa one of the lines is faded here. So what happened here is that this vehicle usually follows the green vehicle, but because of the faded line, this vehicle will orient itself to this solid line. And what will happen is that the car will end up in this barrier. So the accident actually happened, as you can see here. Another Tesla driver um, posted a very similar video of his car in the same location online, which you can see here. So here, it's a very bad recording, I appreciate that, but it's at, actually at the same position. And you can see here on the dashboard, this little icon that indicates that autopilot is switched on. So the driver is driving in autopilot, the control is with the vehicle, and you can see on the, on the, in the, in the uh, video here that there is one line faded and one solid line and the vehicle is actually orienting itself, itself on to this solid line as you can see in this video. So now the vehicle realizes that there is something going wrong and you can hear, no you cannot hear, but you can see from this icon that it appears and disappears indicating that the human should take back control. So you can see that there, the AI, the artificial intelligence of the vehicle is actually recognizing something for the human to act and taking back, and taking back control in a very short time. When we look into the report, we can actually see that the transition between the autonomous vehicle and the human has been unsuccessful. So this gave us then indication to look more into what is happening between transitions of auto autonomous vehicles to manual driving. And there was a recent study um, that was published in 2021 that concludes that Tesla drivers, for instance, become inattentive when they switch on their autopilot. So when they their autopilot is activated. So what we have done in our lab is to understand First of all, what is the situational awareness of the human? So to actually ask the human, you have to take it back control now. And so we have looked into the eyes. So where in the field is the human looking, but also into the brain activity to then use artificial intelligence and objectively measure the situational awareness. And if the situational awareness of the human is not um, sufficient, then we will ask uh, the vehicle to provide touch feedback, haptic touch feedback, to indicate to the driver to take back control. So we have looked into um, a PEPL test, which is used in healthcare, 
to understand the situational awareness of the human using um, signals from the brain or only. And there we can identify which parts of the brains are active when there's low or high situational awareness of the human. And we can actually understand if the human has high situational awareness with an accuracy of seven, almost 70%. So then we have gone to the driver seat and we have embedded a number of soft robotic arrays into the driver seat, as you can see here. So this was done by um, Jan Peters, who was working in my team. And each of the um, silicon structures is made out of a cylindrical shaped um, fiber silicon composite that can be pneumatically actuated. In fact, we prepared a number of these that can be simultaneously hydraulically and pneumatically actuated to change stiffness. So you can see here some of these experiments that we done, have done with these soft robots. So you can see how the water, how the hydraulic actuation is um, pushing fluid into the robot. And the ore in the, in the other figures, you can see how the pneumatic air pressurization is pushing the um, water out of the, uh, out of the soft robot again. And what you can see here, you can, see here in the graph is that you can actually can change between hydraulic and pneumatic actuation and hence control the stiffness. So we have then integrated a number of these soft robotic actuators, as you can see here, into a driving seat. We have built during COVID times a mock-up of a driving simulator using a screen and a Logitech um, uh, steering wheel and then performed a number of tests. So we have done a few tests to understand the acceptance and the perception of this new technology in a vehicle through questionnaires, but also through objective measures, for example, eye tracking or EEG data. And then we have compared the acceptance, so the usefulness on the right-hand side and the satisfaction of this technology. We have compared this to, for example, visual um, feedback systems from other automotive companies such as BMW. And you can see that, in fact, the average on the usefulness and the satisfaction is outperforming the visual feedback that is currently available in automated vehicles. So after COVID, labs were open again, and we actually took the chance to now build a full-size um, driving simulator. So here you can see a small video. Um, this was implemented only in October last year, so a year ago at UCL. So you can see here our participant who wears an EEG cap and wears eye-tracking glasses. And our full-size car simulator has a 180 degrees field of view. And if you're interested in this, please contact me. I will show my email address in a second. And you can actually, if you have a driver license, participate in um, some of the experiments that are, we are running um, in situational awareness and haptic feedback in automated vehicles at the moment. All of this is implemented into a new facility that we have at UCL called UCL Pearl. This is standing for Person Environment Activity Research Laboratory. And these are 4,000 square meter of space in which we can control light, sound, and smell. And our driving simulator is, in fact, embedded in this new facility in Dagenham East um, in, the, in East London. But of course, there are many different challenges in the world of autonomous driving. Um, I mentioned the classification of high and low situational awareness, but how can we um, combine maybe physiological and behavioral sensors? We will also look into what type of feedback is actually suitable for the human or do different type of humans be um, preferred different multimodal feedback. 
combine a combination of audio, visual, and haptic feedback. And there are many more um, challenges in autom autonomous vehicles and automated driving concerning the human machine or human robot interaction. If you are interested in soft robots, there are also many challenges that I think researchers in general need to address in order to ensure that soft robotic technology can have a positive uh, impact on our society. I mentioned a few of them here, um, but would very much like to invite you to have a look at these uh, papers that are available, I believe also open accessible. These are from my colleagues and they are talking about the design and fabrication of these soft robots or how these soft robots stiffen, how they can be stiffened or even modeled and controlled. So I think these are um, nice, literature that uh, gives a very nice introduction to the world of soft robotics. But of course, you're also welcome to contact me if you're interested in this. I would like to close with two things. The first thing is that the biggest and uh, the flagship conference in robotics from the IEEE is coming to London in 2023. So if you're a uh, undergrad or postgraduate taught student and you want to volunteer, I'm sure that we are opening soon a call for volunteers. If you are interested in robotics in general, please do come along. It is running from the 29th of May until the 2nd of June. The um, IET will be involved and will probably have an exhibition stand in our area. The entire conference will be held in Excel. All this work has been done by a lot of people behind this talk, and I would like to acknowledge all of them. So we are about 15 people in our team who are continuously day-to-day -day working on what I have presented today. And of course, I would also like to acknowledge the funding bodies that trusted the team um, and provided funding for many of the work that I have presented here. So thank you very much for attending today's lecture. Please um, feel free to contact me. Um, my email is at the bottom right of this slide, but you can also, of course, follow me on Twitter or visit my website if you're interested. And now I'm very happy to answer some questions and I hope we have a few minutes. I'm very happy to stay a little bit longer. Yes, thank you so much, Helga. That was a very, very interesting topic. Um, and I think we'll all agree that we've enjoyed tonight's lecture. Um, we do have a couple of questions on the chat. One of them is a more general one about CPD certificates. I just need to confirm with IUT staff to make sure that I can get the appropriate links if one is available. And I should be able to post it on the webinar um, recording on YouTube and also on the uh, Commentary and Warwickshire local network site. Um, so please on the lookout for that if they are available. Um, we have a second question. This is quite a long one from Edward. Um, so Edward has said, a fairly open-ended question, but what techniques are you using to both manufacture and integrate soft robotic elements? I've been doing some hobby level work on variable tactile soft surfaces, e.g. changes in surface geometry and texture, colour and temperature. And the big issue is in integrating stiffening and fluid gallery elements along with the actuators themselves into the overall silicon item. Laminated latex works pretty well and has an avenue to automated adhesive placement, but this is not suitable for those with latex sensitivity or allergy, and overmoulding silicone onto the latex has bonding issues. Yes, it's a very good question, Edward. Thank you very much. Um, I've strayed away to the point there's not a simple um, answer to this, but I can try to cover most. Um, the first thing is we use molding um, manufacturing processes. So our molds are made out of a 3D printer. Um, some of them are made out of PLA. So you can nicely uh, use your 3D printer to have not only one mold, but ours are reasonably complex. So we have 
some of these soft robots that I showed in the very beginning, they probably have molds that are made out of 20, 30, 40 components and use multiple stages of molding. I'm very happy to talk you through this. Please just um, contact me. Um, but because of 3D printing being literally available for hobby level work, so they only cost sometimes a few hundred pounds nowadays, you can actually make your molds uh, fairly easy. And then we use silicon called Ecoflex silicon. Uh, there's a, a provider in the UK who provides Ecoflex silicon. Very happy to share the details. Don't want to make advert for any company, um, but this has been our supplier for many years. And they have different type of silicon and rubber-like material. And adhesives as well they also use this they also sell spray which helps you to take off silicon layers of 3d printed parts in some cases i have to say we also go from 3d printed molds to metal molds so we see and see them because you have it's just easier to get the silicon layers off so then you go into the area of using different type of materials than silicon because of the allergies. And um, there are, I, I think it's called TPU, um, that we, so we look into manufacturing pockets that can be inflated made out of TPU um, layers. And you can uh, use, for example, a soldering um, gun to fuse two layers of this TPU and then they you make them also you seal them essentially and you can put a little pipe in there to then provide some uh, pneumatic actuation and some of these pockets we include them into a structure of fabric so there's also more advanced sewing the sewing machines that you can actually put some g-code in and then they can uh, put uh, fabric into uh, fabric sleeve and suture a certain pattern. So very interesting work. It's, a lot of things are trial and error. And um, in, in, in general, I would say that there's not one type of fabrication or manufacturing process, but very happy to talk offline as well. Thank you. And another one we've received is how big is an area of study is this? Um, how many groups in the UK and globally are working on soft robotics? That's a very good question. Um, when you look at the very beginning of soft robotics, this has started by a professor in um, in Japan at the university at Tokyo Tech, and they have looked into soft robots. I think in the early eighties, I think eighty four. And then it didn't really take off. I think if you look at the videos, you will also understand a little bit why we didn't have YouTube as well, uh, but it appeared on YouTube um, uh, later on. And then I think in the 2000s, it has taken um, on um, much more. You can see the publications uh, from 2005 or 2010 onwards. Um, there were two very large soft robotic EU projects. Um, I think one of them may be around 2008 to 2012 or 13, and then the other one that I was part of, 2012 to 2015. And at the same time in America, they also got a platform grant on soft robotics. In the entire world, I believe that there are, from the research side, so from academia, that there are probably about, let's say, a thousand, a thousand five hundred people working on this. And um, there's a conference that is organized annually. And um, this conference is called the International Conference of Soft Robotics. And um, this year it was in Edinburgh. And I believe that about 500 people from all over the world would attend this conference. We have to always be careful with numbers because of the pandemic and some people cannot travel anymore in Asia, for instance. 
but about 500 people would meet there. That doesn't mean that everyone comes who works on soft robotics. So my estimation is that there are probably two, three times more. And you have to see that the world of soft robotics is very multidisciplinary. So we have roboticists, we have computer scientists who work on, on mathematicians who work on different models, AI, machine learning, and then material scientists who supply different type of materials that then can be used by roboticists to build soft robots. So uh, uh, not only robotics community, but a community that also reaches into other materials and manufacturing other communities as well. Okay, and I think we have time for just one more question tonight. Again, if um, your question isn't answered, in the chat, there is Helga's email so that you can get in touch with him after. Um, and this final question for today comes from Saba. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, is there any similarities to snake robots in use in underwater manipulations or operations? Any collaboration with groups working on snake robots? And is your work closely coupled to KUKA robots? Um, so the underwater robotics, they are looking into soft robots for underwater applications. And I think that the first under robot, underwater robots has been delivered, I think by Stanford. And the person there is Kadeep, uh, I think. Um, please do look into this. I have not been following that closely, but also I understand in Germany, they are also interested in soft robotic hands for underwater manipulation and there might be advantages to use soft robots in fact not only because they are compliant but also because there's only a difference that you need to overcome brilliant okay so i think that um draws our q a session to a close i'd just like to say thank you again to our speaker helga for coming on and joining us tonight to deliver this webinar and uh thank you everyone so much for attending we really appreciate you taking the time out to come and join us tonight and we hope to see you at some of our events soon